Hello and welcome to this third Finishing 5 video on Macbeth. As with the previous ones, the idea is that we pick five key moments from across the play, each with a different extract. We talk about what happened before the extract, during it and afterwards, and that by covering all five extracts, you essentially cover the entire play. So in terms of what's happened so far, well, the witches met at the start of the play and mentioned that they were planning to meet Macbeth. We heard King Duncan receiving reports of the heroism of Macbeth and Banquo in a battle, and also about King Duncan deciding to reward Macbeth with the title Thane of Corda. Macbeth and Banquo then met the witches, who told Macbeth three things, that he was Thane of Glance, that he would be Thane of Corda, and that he would also be king. Banquo, remember, was promised that his future descendants would be kings. Macbeth then had the prophecies proven by finding out that he'd been made Thane of Corda. Duncan then decided to stay with Macbeth and Lady Macbeth at their castle that night, and Lady Macbeth hatched a plan to drug Duncan's guards so that Macbeth could use their daggers to murder the king. Macbeth imagined a dagger guiding him towards the murder, and then left the stage to do the deed. Now, in terms of what happens in this extract, we join the scene after Macbeth has committed the murder of Duncan, but he's returned with the daggers. Now, in the extract, Lady Macbeth orders Macbeth to return those daggers to Duncan's room, but Macbeth's terrified to go back, and he's terrified to confront what he's done. So while Lady Macbeth goes back to do it herself, Macbeth is horrified by the blood on his hands. But Lady Macbeth, in turn, ridicules him when she returns. Extract 3 from Act 2, Scene 2, and this is Macbeth and Lady Macbeth after the murder. Why did you bring the daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go and carry them, and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think what I have done. Look on again, I dare not. Oh, infirm of purpose. Now give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. To the eye of childhood that fears the painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. Oh, whence is that knocking? How is it with me when every noise appalls me? What hands are these? Ugh, they pluck out my eyes. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash his blood clean from my hand? No, this my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red. My hands are of your colour. But I shame to wear a heart so white. Right, let's dissect the extract. Now, Lady Macbeth in this scene seems to have abandoned any attempt at hiding her contempt for her husband. Go carry them, she orders him, following her plan that means the daggers must lie there. Now, blood is a key image here. Throughout the play, remember, it represents family, violence and guilt. And in the murder of Duncan, all three of those things collide. Duncan is, remember, Macbeth's cousin. He's killed through Macbeth's violence, Macbeth's go-to solution to every problem, it seems. And also it's the cause of Macbeth's guilt here. Macbeth, of course, is terrified to confront what he's done, or even to think about it, let alone look on it again. This is, remember, the heroic, sword-wielding warrior from Act 1, Scene 2, and he's been turned by his own ambition and weakness in relation to his wife into a guilty murderer with a dagger. Notice the abrupt partial lines here between the two of them. It's intended to make the scene feel jumpy, sharp, tense. Lady Macbeth makes the link between the sleeping and the dead, and it's that link that will torment both of the Macbeths throughout the rest of the play. Macbeth, remember, will claim to have murdered sleep, and Lady Macbeth will sleepwalk in her own guilt in Act 5. It's also noticeable that Lady Macbeth ridicules her husband for his emotional state. "'Tis the eye of childhood, she sneers, that fears a painted devil." The knocking off stage is the impending arrival of Macduff and Lennox to wake up Duncan, and that's adding to the sense of pressure in the scene. Macbeth's focus, however, is not simply on the sounds, but on his own hands. He can't even recognise them as his own, and wishes he could pluck out mine eyes so that he doesn't have to see them. 
Macbeth's question as to whether all great Neptune's ocean can wash this blood clean from my hand is a forlorn hope, with the ocean reference essentially asking whether all the water in the world can ever make Macbeth clean again, both literally and metaphorically. And there is a hint of the idea of baptism there, the forgiveness of sins. And the best conclusion here is that his hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine, that rather than the seas washing his hands, his hands will turn the seas red, suggesting the enormity of his guilt, linked also to the fact that this is Duncan's blood. Now remember, Duncan was king, and the belief pushed by the Tudors and the Stuarts was that kings were appointed by God. By killing a king, Macbeth has not just sentenced his eternal soul to damnation, but disrupted the entire order of the world. Now, Lady Macbeth's dismissal of her husband is telling, and a clear sign of the dynamic between them. With blood now on her hands as well from the daggers, her hands are of your colour, but she, in contrast, would shame to wear a heart so white. Macbeth, she means, is a coward. With white also a link back to the milk of human kindness that she mentioned back in Act 1, Scene 5. This is, of course, also a link forwards to Act 5, where it becomes Lady Macbeth who sleepwalks, who is convinced that there is blood on her hands that she can never get rid of, and who cannot escape her own guilt. Now, in terms of what happens after this scene, when Duncan's body is discovered, Malcolm and Donaldbane, Duncan's sons, flee the country, convinced that they're in danger. With Duncan's heir, Malcolm, now under suspicion for his father's murder, the crown is given to the next logical choice. Duncan's cousin, Scotland's saviour, the heroic general and respected Thane, Macbeth. Macbeth, however, is suspicious of Banquo, and Banquo no longer trusts Macbeth. Now, as previously, don't forget that there is a whole range of other things out there to help you revise. There is, of course, the recipe book with all the things in there in terms of quotation banks and protagonist profiles and, and all those sorts of things. There is, of course, a set of quotation cards that you have been given and that are available in academies. There is, of course, the quotation of the day on the NET English um, uh, Twitter feed. There is, of course, your Need to Know book with a whole load of things in there. And there is, in addition, the YouTube channel with hundreds of videos covering the narrative, the characters, themes, quotations, and so on and so forth. Right, and that's it for this third video in this series. And I will hope to see you in video four.